One of the most common questions that I get asked by other machinists is, how do I become a good programmer? But before we can answer that question, we first need to understand what a good programmer even is. What do you really mean when you're asking me that? Because for a lot of people, what they really mean when they ask this question is, how do I get good at using the CAM software? But that is not what makes you a good programmer. You can learn every click and every button in the CAM software, but that doesn't mean you can produce a good part. Being a good programmer goes so much deeper than that. But that's not what everybody else is going to tell you. They're going to tell you to be a good programmer, you're going to have to learn this toolpath or that toolpath or this toolpath. But this goes far beyond just making toolpath. That's easy. I can show you any toolpath in 10 minutes. So I'm going to throw all of that out. And in this video, I'm going to give you the top five things that you need to know that nobody else is going to tell you to become a good programmer. Not a good programmer, a great programmer. So number one is to always keep an open mind. I don't care if you have one year or 30 years experience. You will never know it all. And there is always something you can learn. Understand that no matter what you're machining, there is always a better way. Everything can be improved upon. So if you go into every project with a closed mind and the attitude that you know everything, then you may be missing out on a huge opportunity for improvement. Innovation is happening every day in this trade. Advancements in tools, coatings, fixturing and processes are never ending. And if you don't stay up to date on all of these things, then you will 100% be left behind. I've worked with machinists right out of college and everything I tried to tell them, they would argue with me saying, well, that's not how we did it in school. And I would come back with, okay, in your two years of school, you've learned everything you need to know. I also worked with another programmer that had this mentality and he didn't want to listen to anyone else on the team because he was the only one of us that had over 30 years experience. So in his mind, there was nothing that we could ever teach him. Well, one day he was given this semi-complex aluminum part that had a lot of thin walls, some tight tolerances, and really no good way to hold it. Every single programmer on the team looked at that part individually. And without even consulting each other, we all said that this part should be machined using the picture frame method. That would make it the most simple process. But he didn't listen to any of his peers, and he chose to hold the part in a vise. Well, as you can imagine, the vise ended up distorting the part, and all of the tight tolerance features were machined out of location, and we had to end up going back and reprogramming it using the picture frame method. Now, I'm not saying you must always take other people's advice, but you do need to at least hear them out because they may be seeing something that you're overlooking. Number two is you need to learn and understand all of the variables because there are so many things that come into play when you're machining. The machine, the spindle connection, the tool, the holder, fixturing, the material properties, feed, speeds, metal removal rates, risk and reward. Knowing and understanding all of these things will ultimately determine what machining method you will use to machine a particular part. For instance, your machine will have a certain horsepower and torque spec you'll have to account for. And that's gonna change depending on the speed you're running at. You may have a tool that you ran at 400 inches per minute one time, but if you're using it in an extended length holder for this operation, then you'll need to adjust the feed and speed to keep it from chattering or breaking. The same can be said for fixtures. You won't be able to maximize roughing operations if you don't have a rigid fixture or a rigid setup. This is especially true depending on what material you're machining. I once programmed a five axis part that was originally made out of brass and the process I wrote worked great for that material. But when they changed the part to stainless steel, I had to alter some of the methods that I used because the fixturing method that I had was okay for the brass, but it was not rigid enough for stainless steel. The more you understand about all these things and how they all influence your process, then you can really start fine tuning your methods by paying attention to the metal removal rates. One machining method may have a higher metal removal rate under normal circumstances, but if you had to alter your feeds and speeds due to any of the variables that I've mentioned, then suddenly a different machining strategy may end up being more efficient. And you also must keep in mind the risk and reward of doing things. Being the most efficient you can be is the name of the game, but that doesn't always mean having the most efficient program. I've written programs that were wasting a little bit of time cutting air, and I didn't like that and I wanted to get rid of it. 
So before I knew it, I'd spent three hours on something that only saved me three minutes of cycle time. Now, if you're in a shop running production, then that's fine because that's the ultimate goal is to reduce cycle time. But in a job shop environment, making a one-off part, then that was just a waste of time. Number three, be proactive and not reactive. If you're a programmer and you have an operator running your machine, don't just expect them to know what you know or know what you want to do. They can't read your mind and don't expect them to. Give them a detailed setup sheet with notes on everything to watch for and any special instructions. So when you're writing a program or creating a process, try to envision everything that can go wrong during the process. Because if it can happen, it will. And if there is any way you can prevent it from happening at the programming stage, whether that be by adding additional qualifying features for the operator to check or M0 program stops and notes on the setup sheet then you can potentially save a lot of machine downtime or scrapped parts. Learning to see what can go wrong before it happens and compensating for that in your process may add a little bit of time, but it can also help bring up your yield percentage. Something as simple as adding tools to deburr every feature on your part in the machine rather than relying on the operator can save you and them a ton of headaches. Because what if you get an operator who doesn't feel like deburring his parts? or misses some of the features and you end up shipping parts with burrs all over them. That's not gonna be good for anyone, but the machine will do it every single time. Now I know that trying to predict everything that can happen is impossible, and there are going to be things that you just don't see coming. But I promise you, if you start thinking about this every single time you program a part, then soon you will be creating very safe and effective processes that produce less scrap and less stress for you and your operators. They'll learn that you have their back and in turn, they'll have yours. Also by doing this, you'll learn how to simplify your processes. There's no need to overcomplicate things or confuse anyone that's trying to follow your methods. And by creating simple processes that are easy to follow and even adopting pokayoke methods, which is a Japanese term for mistake proofing, this will reduce the risk of human error and guesswork. It's all about programming with a certain level of safety in your process. Number four, you need to understand and evaluate tooling. You need to try to understand all of them, even the ones that you don't use. Study the different types of tools, what they're used for and their strengths and weaknesses. This is gonna help you when you're trying to figure out what tool to use for a certain process, like choosing between a high feed mill or a solid carbide end mill. You may be in a situation where you have to program both the tools to see which one is actually more efficient, but understanding them before you get to that point will help you program and use them correctly. Spending time researching your tools will also teach you how to choose tools that control chip formation, or even which ones will give you a better finish. You also need to learn to evaluate your tools to know if what you are using is competitive. Look, you can buy the cheapest tool on the market, but is it allowing you to run your machine to its potential? You can buy the most expensive tool on the market, but is it worth the price for the work it's doing? Evaluating your tools will also help organize your tool grid. It will decrease costs in the stock items and save time on setups and tool changeovers. Take the Dodeca face mill, for example. Kinemetal offers inserts for every material with this tool. So that saves us from having to stock multiple face mill bodies. Even the go drills have a universal coating that works well in a range of materials. So that allows us to stock less drill types that may be more material specific. And for a lot of shops, versatile tools like this can save you a lot of money. This is why it's important for you to become friends with the tooling engineers and have them keep you informed and up to date with new technology that's coming out. So you can keep a competitive advantage over other shops that may be stuck using the same technology. And number five is learn how to process a part. Anyone can learn what icons to click in the cam software or what buttons to push on the machine, but looking at a drawing or a model and knowing how to get from raw stock to finished product in the most efficient way with every dimension and tolerance is the true testament for any good machinist or programmer. Now look, nothing can replace experience. The more parts you can get your hands on, the better. Your knowledge can only grow with every part you machine especially if you're following the steps that I've previously mentioned. But you can only learn so much on your own. You're only gonna see things through your eyes. 
So one of the best things you can do is to ask questions and observe others. Ask anyone that's ever worked in multiple shops and they will tell you that in every shop they do things differently. This is because everyone's mind is different. We see things differently. So what I like to do is look at a drawing that someone else is programming and get in my mind how I would program and process it if it were my project. Then I go over to the machine where they're running it and I see how they chose to do it. If it's different than how I would do it, then I go to the programmer and I ask them why they did it that way. But never ask that question because you think that they're wrong. Ask it so you can understand their thought process. They may have more knowledge about something or see something that you're unaware of. And if they're kind enough to give you an answer, you need to thank them and go about your business. And only in your mind decide which idea is better or which one makes more sense. Because this exercise is not meant to doubt or challenge others. It's to try to expand your mind past your own way of thinking. This is how you learn to think outside the box. And I've done this at every place that I have ever worked. And my programming style is a morph of all the people and all the minds that I looked up to at all those places. And it's worked out really well for me. It's easy for us to get tunnel vision and fall into a singular pattern. So by looking around and picking up on the good habits of others, especially the ones who are unconventional thinkers, you can greatly expand your knowledge and expertise in a very short time frame. So that's my take on the top five things that will truly make you a great programmer. So give us a like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe and check out our online store if you wanna help support free education. Thank y'all for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.